Greetings. I'm Sally Stein, the guest curator for this exhibition of Gail Redman, who's at the other end of our lineup. Um, of this exhibition, I hope you all either have had a chance to look at it or will, after our talks today, um, have some time to look at it, because I think, I think it's worth looking at closely. Um, I, I don't think that Gail's work and Gail needs too much introduction. There's a sort of autobiographical thread throughout her work. And, uh, um, someone's phone, whatever. Um, except she's been, uh, she grew up first in a suburb in Chicago, she was born in Chicago, grew up in a modest working class suburb of Chicago, a new suburb after World War II. Um, until her father actually rising in the ranks of the UAW took a job in Geneva with the International Metal Workers Union. Uh, and um, then uh, in high school, her parents moved back to Washington so she could finish high school here and went on to Antioch College, a radical college, quite experimental, where she majored in communications and did a lot of work in video though she also studied photography. And, <coughs> sorry, as I argue in the catalog, um, I think that the work in a time extended medium then affected the way she approached photography against the idea of a perfect single moment, but more trying to break a, an action into a, a significant series of moments that we really look at in terms of how they develop and what kind of interactions we see in them, starting with her family sequences and the domestic still lifes and going onward. Then also to look at her father's decline, finally making many segments, portraits of her body as she's aged, but there were even earlier pictures that you see in the front wall of considering herself both as a young woman in relation to older women, uh, an image she had found in the early issue of Ms. Magazine, and uh, then sort of in the 90s, uh, when her sons are sort of halfway to growing up, um, thinking about, oh my God, I'm getting gray hair. What do I do about it? And I'm not gonna um, paraphrase, you can, it's a very funny short story, and you can look at it over at the opening wall. And, and then finally, during COVID, uh, deciding I'm gonna let it all grow out and um, taking a picture while she still had her dyed red hair as, along with the new gray hair. Um, and, and then finally, very recently, making both these self-portraits of herself as an aging woman, uh, but in a very powerful fashion, in my opinion, at, at the same time as she has already begun, well, the screen here, sort of obscures the work of earlier work on changes in the city over time, but becoming an activist much more actively involved in actually fighting changes that would further desecrate uh, the Moses African Cemetery uh, as being part of, a really part of an activist group, the BACC, the Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition. I get, uh, for a long time, I had trouble remembering BACC, what does this stand for? Um, because I'm not from here, I'm from Los Angeles. Um, but I've learned a lot more about the city, looking at Gail's work on this city, starting actually in at the beginning of this century, but culminating so far uh, in this work that one sees at the end of the exhibition. So um, this is a one-person retrospective, which has both the strength of depth and some of the limits of narrowness in terms of a sort of a tunnel vision um, of Gail Rebin, but of someone who I hope it's clear has made over five decades work that references many social fields, feminism, racism in her recent work, and even earlier in the work from early 2000s, uh, but also historic racism in European anti-Semitism that her parents thankfully fled in the nick of time uh, and made it to America. But Gail and I agreed this offers just one perspective and approach to making art, and we wanted to offer a platform to diversify the experiences 
viewpoints and art practices of first generation American artists, which is why we're so grateful for these three participants, plus another who unfortunately is ill today and couldn't make it. So we're very grateful for the, for the participation of this panel of a number of local artists who have experienced different sorts of divided identities and have made quite different kinds of work. I urge them to consider commenting on one piece or series in this exhibition uh, by another first generation American artist, but only after they introduce us to a bit of their own work. According, and one of these artists, Kang Lei, actually has a work on the other side of this wall in another exhibition. So I urge you to go see that as well um, after the conversation. Accordingly, I'm keeping introductions brief to allow the artists more time to talk about their work and then share what they find similar or perhaps quite different in Reb Han's work on exhibit here. So without further ado, Amita Sarin is a writer, storyteller, researcher, and media consultant, as well as creator, that starts uh, with her intensive work on a screenplay based on historical events and characters in her homeland of India. Her screenplay, The Last Royals, got optioned and started development before COVID, but then, alas, stalled out during the COVID period. Undeterred, Sarin drew on her work teaching university courses on Indian art and cultural history, including a course on world sacred architecture, which led to her current work on a documentary, The Nation's Capital, Home to the World, about places of, about very diverse places of worship in the DC area. Now that it's in post-production, Sarin is planning a broader series under the rubric, A Sacred Piece of Home, offering viewers a visual feast of distinctive architecture in styles from all over the world that have found a home here in the USA. She aims for viewers to discover iconic places of worship, both monumental and small, with much context about the communities that envisioned, built, and then used them as places of worship. I personally am not a devout observer, but I can, can't wait to learn from this series. She's also written two books on India for children. From the sacred to the commonplace tasty, um, uh, we plan to turn to Rick Garcia, born in Miami. Uh, no, sorry, I'm gonna, let's go to Amita and then we'll go to Rick Garcia. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, that sounded pretty good. <laughs> it's only me, folks. So I have to keep changing glasses depending on whether I'm reading or looking long distance. So, um, yes, I am actually a first generation. Chosen? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I am what you call a foreign born immigrant. So I, I guess I am first generation um, of immigrants. I grew up in India. I was born in, and raised in India and educated there. And I came here in my early 20s. And for an awfully long time, I was my, I was a professional Indian American. <laughs> if you know what I mean. I was a, I guess, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a wonderful thing to be, but I just, I was an India explainer. Uh, that's why I wrote, and this, this went along with raising children in what was a culture that was not very familiar to me, in a culture different from the one I had grown up in. So I wound up writing, writing a book on India uh, that was explaining India, and then um, wrote about India, read about India, spoke about India, I started at the, at the museum downtown as a volunteer and then became a research assistant and then went <coughs> on to work on an exhibition. The whole idea was to stay connected to India because I was in some ways a typical immigrant, maybe not typical of all immigrants, but I was very, very attached to my Indian American identity. and in. I, I led Smithsonian tours to India and I lectured on those. So I stood in front of buildings and explained me, the thing that's most interesting about countries like India is the places of worship. So Hindu temples, 
mosques, Sikh temples, <laughs> Buddhist stupas, things like that. So I pretty much became an expert at speaking about places of worship and the religions uh, that provided the context for it. And I wound up teaching courses on India at the University of Maryland. Uh, at this point, I expanded my identity to, to that of a more general immigrant identity. Because I could see uh, for a long time I could see the connections between me and other people from other places because in the Washington area we live in an extraordinarily multinational place because of the embassies and because it's a big city it's an important city we have people from all over the world here and I could see a lot of commonalities between us and them and um, I also felt very acutely the lack of, at the, at the time that I'm speaking of in the 80s and early 90s, there was, um, education was, I would say very narrow in focus uh, in terms of history and social studies. And I was constantly raving and ranting about that. The fact that people, only focused on European history, that they knew so little about the world. And so I decided to make a course that dealt with um, all religions. I mean, I figured I already had quite a few under my belt, you know, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, and so I added Christianity and Judaism, and I invited guest speakers. So I I, and they, they approved of it immediately because there really was a demand by this time, the early 2000s, there was a demand for courses that exposed students to different cultures. And at this point, the seeds of the documentary that I'm working on presently came to be sown. And I, um, I got so interested in the research that I felt I couldn't let it go after I stopped teaching. At first I thought I would write a book, uh, and then I thought that this, you know, making a film about this would be, I, I think film is probably one of the more powerful uh, media of affecting social change, of teaching. I used to show a lot of films in, in class. Can you show, do you have either a little clip before? Okay. okay. Well, uh -huh. uh, it, let me speak about Gail's piece first, if you could just move it back to, okay, so I was interested in, when I looked at the exhibition, and it's, the, the, the screen is covering the actual piece, but I hopefully you saw it before that. When I saw that, it immediately evoked the documentary I'm working on, because it is about compacting, compressing time, in this case, in a two-dimensional surface, and being able to depict many events that have taken place in the same region. And so she has little vignettes, little news stories there, and uh, talks about what the buildings there used to be and what they are today and the events that have taken place there and how time has gone on. And time and change are the two most dependable things in the world. I mean, you know, everything changes. Change is, change is. <laughs> so it is, um, it, it brought to mind uh, a part of my documentary which we internally, as we are working on it, call uh, Changing Congregations. I selected a few places in DC. Now you can move to the map if you like. Uh, I selected a couple of places in DC uh, that had a cluster of places of worship. Let me know when I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay. Um, 
The Washington DC area, I was astonished to find, had approximately 800 places of worship within Washington DC itself. I'm not sure that is accurate because then I got into the records and I started going church by church by church and I found there were some duplicate records and stuff like that. But I haven't counted all 800, but I mean it is in the hundreds. And here is another reason why I selected this topic. Because when I lived in India, my exposure to America was through Hollywood. The movies we saw. And when I actually came here in the 70s and began to live here, uh, many of our friends were either Jewish or Christian, and we attended weddings, we attended bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, Jewish weddings, Christian weddings, communions, confirmations, in the spaces, the places of worship, in synagogues and churches. And I became aware with a with a kind of a shock that, boy, there are a lot of places of worship here. And the Americans are kind of religious people. No matter what I read in the papers today about declining church membership and how the younger generation is not interested in religion and all this, but I'm sorry, the, the, the statistics, it's still a very large number of people do. I mean, they built all these places. Maybe it's on the way to change, but I thought that was quite remarkable. And so this is what also got me very interested. This was something I didn't know about. Although I went to a Catholic school in New Delhi, although I'm a Hindu, I went to a Catholic school in New Delhi, and I've grown up alongside Catholicism, but I still had not, you know, maybe that was one of the few churches in the city, not like here. So this was a this was a source of curiosity for me. I needed to know more about it. I needed to learn more about the different kinds of denominations and the different kinds of places of worship. So that's one of the things that got me going. So this snapshot is um, just a, a screenshot that I took of Google Earth. My Google Earth slides are not yet ready for the film. Uh, so uh, pardon me for the way this looks. But I was trying to show you 16th Street, which is one of the first, one of the first churches that is still around in the city was built on 16th Street in 1816. So Washington, the, they decided to make Washington in about 1790 or 91, and 1816 was the first church, St. John's Episcopal, which is the church of the presidents, very close to the White House. And then Lafar had, had decided that the 16th Street would be like a grand avenue, you know, that would lead to the, to the White House. And so it became a very early on, it became a city of prestige, a, a street of prestige. And so it, today they say, I haven't actually counted 50 places, but there are a great many on the six and a half mile street to the Maryland border. Great many places of worship. Most of them are Christian. There are one or two Catholic, uh, no actually, Mm, well, mainly Protestant places of worship, a couple of Buddhist, it's not very diverse, but then we are looking at the buildings that were made as the city grew and they're going outwards. So you can see all the red dots, other places of worship. Okay, next slide please. So in the early part of the development of the city, we had uh, predictably a uh, majority Christian base with a few other places of worship mixed in. As the city grew in the 80s and 90s, we had, because of the change in immigration, could you, th that is the next slide. Uh, because of the change in immigration and as the city grew beyond the Beltway, uh, Beltway was made and the city grew beyond it, uh, people started moving into this because place in, this, in Washington DC was very hard to find. 
So this is why suddenly we had people coming in from Vietnam, from Cambodia, from, from uh, India because of the change in immigration laws. So suddenly you had a very diverse set of people and they built their places of worship out, outside the limits of Washington DC itself. So this street was written up many times. It was called Highway to Heaven and it did. It, it really is. This is another uh, impetus for my film because one day I got lost on New Hampshire Avenue and I wound up driving past this. I thought I was in Disneyland, you know, they were all so different. And that's what got me started on this, on this odyssey. So anyway, let's hope it will be completed and I will done. I look forward to seeing it. We're just going to start, stop briefly at the work of Rick Garcia, who, because of illness, can't be here. Um, I sort of, as a segue, called it from the sacred to the commonplace tasty. Um, Garcia is, was born in Miami of Cuban political refugees, studied graphic design at the University of Miami, and now is a painter, digital printmaker, uh, and curator. Um, I'm very sorry that I, I have to speak here. Uh, he's very interested in food and the way food becomes a possibly pseudo-sacred or semi-sacred object in terms of a new kind of icon. Um, he has often been hailed as a person who's revived pop but given it a new sort of Latin identity at, while showing how thriving is Latin culture in America. He's been in many shows that hailed his work as rebranding pop uh, in terms of the vitality of pop culture, that, uh, of Latin culture that is rooted and thrives in the U.S. Moving, and I'm, he's also very interested in comic book heroes that have a sort of Latin roots, etc. But because he's not here, I'm not going to attempt to explain further his work, and we'll move on to Monica Johan Boas, has U.S. degrees in get this, art, mathematics, and law, while developing her art and activism with a strong emphasis on her Bangladeshi heritage. She collaborates with rural and urban communities to address issues around gender and climate change, both in film and in painting, and in books. Her ongoing feminist collaborative project, Storytelling with Saris, has traveled to several countries and nine states, and been featured in numerous publications, TV, and radio programs. Uh, she, uh, her related first book, Storytelling with Saris, features stunning images from her climate art actions that we'll see a few of, along with writings and Bengali songs, which she also translates. Take it away. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, um, great turnout, and I, um, I actually spent some time in this exhibition yesterday, and I'm really pleased to um, see this amazing show, and there's a lot of uh, um, threads that resonate, um, uh, you know, that, that really resonate in my own work as well. So I'll just share a little bit about my work. So yes, yeah, so I um, actually call myself a half generation. I moved here when I was 10 years old. Um, from Bangladesh via the UK, and um, I um, really became, I mean, I've always thought of myself as multiple identities. My parents are also different religions. My mother was born Muslim, and my father was born Hindu, and um, so I was always navigating um, split religion, split personality, um, split identity, and then after moving here, um, I mean, we didn't really think of ourselves as immigrants at the time, we were more expatriates. And so it was slowly that I developed this kind of Bangladeshi American identity. I didn't actually become an American until I think the 90s. Um, and so, uh, and my work really didn't show anything about Bangladesh until much later, until I actually lived in France in the, um, in the early 2000s. Um, and I think being in a third country, um, you know, sort of brought my own identity into focus for me um, at that point, even though I'd always been aware of it, it wasn't really, it didn't really show up in my art until I was living in France. I think um, being in France somehow um, 
made me, the French are of course very into their own language and culture, but I think being in France and teaching my children Bengali made me really uh, put my own identity in focus. And uh, my work started just kind of exploding with all this stuff about Bangladesh. And speaking about pop art, um, it sort of began with a pop art thing. My mom had mailed me a sari blouse, the top to a sari, and I started painting it as pop art object. But then later it became um, a feminist symbol for women and our bodies, and then it became a feminist flag. And so, um, and so now my work, um, I, I'm really known for this storytelling with saris project, which I founded um, about 10 years ago in 2012. And, these are some images from more recently, from last year actually. But I'm collaborating um, with a dozen women farmers from my mom's ancestral village where she was born, where my foremothers um, have lived um, for generations. And um, it's a little island uh, in the Bay of Bengal called Borobaiti Island. It's very much on the front lines of climate change. So this project, I'm, I'm kind of blending art, activism, um, and we're working on saris often, but I also um, have been collecting the intangible heritage of or oral history songs, which is actually um, the most uh, very, very intensely pre-colonial feminist um, work that exists in South Asia, is the oral tradition women's songs that have been passed on through generations. And so I'm trying to collect those. Um, it's a kind of um, intangible heritage that may well disappear because of globalization and climate change. So um, next, so this is an image of us working on the saris. This is an image from Paris where I did a performance on the, um, that walked all the way down to the river Seine. Um, next, Lena Jaiswal took that image. This is an image from a public art project um, that happened during the pandemic in July 2020 um, along the CNO Canal where I had 22 saris um, that were all covered in climate imagery and uh, about climate change. And, um, and then they also had, I collaborated with Robin Bell um, and we projected images of the women um, in Bangladesh and the people of Washington DC. I had dozens of people who worked with me on the saris here as well. So we projected images of them and also the handwritten journals of the women the women have also been writing climate journals um, for the last 10 years. So some of their writings were also projected on there. So my work is also very text-based. There's a lot of text in my works and really resonating. Um, Gail's work really, um, I find it, I haven't seen that much work in photography that actually has text on the photographs. And it's really, um, um, it's really uh, very, very um, interesting. And I don't know if you want us to talk about the, the piece um, so uh, it was hard to choose, really. There's so many pieces here that really resonated with me. And um, the, um, the, the Living series over here, back here, with, uh, with the beautiful um, pictures of aging skin, um, really was, uh, my sister and I were here yesterday, and we really spent a lot of time. I mean, those are just so evocative. And so, um, you know, uh, um, as, as, yeah, as, as a woman who's also aging, you really like, you know, it really, really grab and, and the use of text, some of the words from Yiddish and other words underneath um, are also really, really powerful. These, and some of them I didn't know. I didn't know some of these words, but they describe aging women, and it's really, um, so anyway, I thought that was um, uh, very, the works are very, that piece is really um, interesting to me. And the other work I wanted to talk about um, is called Banned Books, and it's right there. Um, and actually, I'm going to just pull up this image I have of it. Um, so this started this, this curved wall over here. Yeah, it's at the curve, and that piece really um, spoke to me uh, because it, um, in that Gail is drawing on her own father's, um, her own family history, and um, uh, she, she writes on the, on, it's, a, it's a collage photograph, I would say, right? So it's, it's got a map of Europe and talks about how her father had to move from Germany to Belgium because he was dating non-Jewish girls, <laughs> and Gentiles. And then when he was in Belgium, he got to read all the books that were banned in Germany. And in that work, she's got images of these banned books. Um, and uh, anyway, and it's, uh, it's really interesting that she's drawing upon her own family history from the old world in making this um, kind of 
you know, composite artwork with text and imagery. And it, it reminded me of um, this, my very first performance um, piece was called Indelible Scent. Um, I did it in DC uh, first um, for the, uh, at the, at the um, what's it called? Um, I did it in DC, and then I did it at Art Basel for the Art Asia Miami, and in it, um, I'm also drawing on my family history. Um, I'm in a bed covered in saris, and I'm reading banned books uh, in Bengali, uh, including uh, books, um, some banned books and some books that are not banned, but um, books written by women. And it's, it's also um, drawing on the history of my, my own grandmother, who was married at age seven. So it's this performance piece where I'm lying in the bed and I'm, but I'm reading a book and I have my iPhone with me and people can text me and I can text them passages. So I was trying to make this kind of um, story, uh, kind of turning the, the, um, the, the, the myth of the woman lying back you know, on his head and having this kind of empowered woman um, reading banned books and I would text passages back to people. But anyway, your piece really spoke to me because it had this whole element of text, um, you know, family history and banned books. And I think, you know, the, the fact that you use text in your work um, is very powerful. It's political because, you know, books have been, words have been banned. Women weren't allowed to really go to school until, you know, the 20th century in many places in the world. Women couldn't go to law school until um, the 70s in this country. Um, and so I think, um, that spe peacefully speaks to me because of the way that you really tie in text and freedom of expression in so many ways. So, and intergenerationally. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on then, and these are, of course, are very brief introductions. And for Conley, and there is one work outside uh, on the other wall there that you can easily find. His Vietnamese identity plays a central, but so far at least, and this is simply based on checking his website, uh, to my mind, a veiled role in his artwork, but this is looking at earlier work, in which he probes his personal and family history uh, for strong sources for their own hybrid identity as displaced refugees. I'm especially interested in the contrast between its richly patterned mosaic style imagery, um, which I just overheard before the panel began. Uh, he's now working on a project where this kind of layering also relates more directly to being a fence. Uh, and I can't wait to see that. With faces often obscured, and Reven's arguably more conventional approach to the changing faces of her immigrant relatives because actually this exhibition includes both the bad boy son in Europe reading banned books and actually being banished to Belgium so he's not picked up by the Nazis when he's uh, a young uh, teenager dating Gentiles. And then over here later, uh, his decline as an old man. And Gail's work <coughs> helping take care of him. But Conley, please speak more. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for be, uh, having me here. Uh, Gail, it was such a fantastic uh, exhibition. Um, my name is Khan, and I'm a printmaker slash bedazzler here in DC. Uh, bedazzler as in, uh, if you can go to the next slides, one more. Uh, I do a lot of rhinestones, uh, a lot of acrylic jewels, uh, and then patternings on top of old family photographs um, that either are taken um, during our time here as first time uh, immigrant or as refugees in refugee camps. Um, both myself and my wife are refugees. Um, I myself are uh, is a, a family that is three different re uh, wave of refugees because after the Vietnam War there was the boat people uh, that was my aunt and uncle who fled uh, stranded at sea because part the pirate pirate stopped their boat robbed them and left them for uh, at sea and but luckily there was a Dutch boat that was crossing by and because of that. 
Um, they, they, wa they didn't want to do anything with the, the Vietnamese, and so the only thing they could do was toss them a sort of a rope and have uh, and pull their boat into the Philippines. And that's where my aunt stayed for a year and a half as refugee camps. Um, my, because my father and uncles were prisoner of war after the Vietnam War, um, my uncle served 13 years while my father served five years. Um, after we got, they got out of the, the concentrate, uh, the re-education camp, uh, we decided to fled to Bangkok. And from there, we applied paperwork uh, to come to the United States. And the last one is, if you can go to the last picture, one more, is of my grandmother. And after 1994, when President, former President Clinton lifted the embargo on Vietnam, it allowed us to apply for reunifications uh, with our family members. So she was the third wave of Vietnamese refugees. So there was vet refugees leaving Vietnam due to the result of the Vietnam War. And a lot of my work uh, started uh, at first, if you look at, into my website, you'll probably see a lot of images that deals with the family settings. So those were us American trying to settling into the, the du dual role between living as a Vietnamese and being an American here in the United States. But I guess around 2014, 2015, the Syrian crisis sparked a lot of the images of Syrians who fled and coming over to Europe, uh, coming ashore, seeing them, you know, um, holding their ch children in their arms, uh, walking up to shore where a lot of European countries decided not to either cast them out or not help them in any way. It brought a lot of memories and so I began a lot of this series of my own family as refugees in, in, um, in Bangkok. And then eventually with Afghanistan, our troop withdrawal in Afghanistan, um, with it later on, it sort of forced me to deal with a lot of issues like how do I talk about these, my own, the, the refugee experience, but the best way I can talk about it is probably from my own family point of view. And so a lot of these images sort of span the conversations of how do I talk about this? Because one of the critics that is really big when I was studying art was Susan Sontag. And uh, her crit criticisms on, in regards to the pains of other is about how do we look at images on atrocities, on war, looking at the images, what its meaning beyond just pain and suffering. And how do we now, in 2016 to 2020, when former President Trump talked about immigrant of these sort of like useless people coming to our border, how do we talk about that conversation with people as uh, they don't belong, they don't have any values? And, and because of that, I love Michaels. I go to Michaels every week and I, I get buckets of jewels because th these acrylic jewels are not your like a Kraskowski crystal. They're not your Tiffany diamonds, you know? They're like cheap, replaceable. So for me, I grew an affinity to these medium because I, I feel that they connect to the refugees experience because they're cheap, they're discardable. If, if you lose one, you can get another for a, an inexpensive amount of price. And for me, 2016, 2020 began to change my mindset when our own presence talk about the livelihoods of refugees who are seeking for help. And so how do I alter that is by sitting in my studio with hundreds of hours sorting jewels into little piles because these become my meditative process of processing my own childhood, living in a, an abandoned factory with 500 other families waiting for you, United Nation to approve of our visa status to come to the United States. And so they, by sorting these jewels, I'm, 
I'm re remembering of all these moments of all of us family piling in but sorting into like different area and so then it becomes sort of uh, a moment for me it was like if I can give these uh, um, invaluable uh, not valuable materials a place the things of their own I'm creating a new narrative and so for me transitioning from traditional photograph, taking the photo image of us in refugee camp and transform them into painting, allowing me to change their status, but still give, give its material, honoring its material, what its essence is without de degrading its social status. And so it was very important for me in the materiality and the process that I sort of engage in that, these moment. And if you can go back to the, the, the photograph, all the way back, but at the same time as I was doing this project, as you can see, bacteria is slowly destroying the photograph of us in refugee camps. Um, because they laminate these photographs. And at the same time, the, the photograph is currently slowly being eaten away and for me to preserve this and to transform it to something else new if you can flip to this to change it through the medium of painting allowing me to have its own to give it its own second life and as an uh, immigrant uh, having that second opportunity it was so important uh, growing up uh, my father, my fa my fa I'm the first one to go to college. Um, the highest form of education in my family was probably high school. And so for me to go to uh, college and then grad school and being able to do this was uh, sort of a changing. But then, you know, like as, as an immigrant family, we were, we were focusing on doctors and, <laughs> and engineer as the goal, but to have your son focus on art because something was eating away at myself is that, that duality, living between two worlds, but yet don't know how to talk about the, the, um, the, the things that sort of um, you see contradictory, but you can't really talk about it is sort of like uh, something that's stood out to me. And one of the, my piece that I think about was, uh, Gail's piece was the dish, dishman, dishman, mm -hmm. the duality of the, the two uh, being from the, the different country, uh, the, those kind of things that stood out. The other one was the, the project with the Meca uh, Macedonia uh, church. Uh, you know, it's there, it's present, but it surrounded was all these sort of like high rise that was um, that was being built around. Everything was demolished. But yet, how do you give a sense of pride to something that you know not everybody give values to? But for the for that community itself, it has its values, you know. And so for me, trans transforming, you know, like values through. Um, moving from photographic image to painting was the, the, the alchemy, the magic of sort of the art that I'm sort of engaged in. I'd love to. Am I on? Uh, yes, it's on. Um, I'd love to start off at this point by first of all thanking the three panelists who spoke. Because it's very moving, and Conley, uh, you changed my whole thinking about dazzle and glitter, um, <laughs> which is itself a revelation for an afternoon. But I've actually been changed by all three talks. But I wanted to hear Gail respond to any thoughts she had, uh, and then to open it up amongst ourselves, and then to invite questions from all of you here. Well, I thought it was really very interesting to see which pieces you chose to talk about. And what you were mentioning about um, immigrants and how they were just devalued was exactly what was going through my mind when people were saying the immigrants who are coming here, they can't speak English, they don't have any education. And that's exactly what my parents were. They couldn't speak English when they came here. 
uh, my parents did not graduate from high school, and they are valuable, and they had very successful lives here, but they were really being devalued. And one thing that has really changed is the way immigration is viewed in this country is that it becomes, I taught for many years at Northern Virginia Community College, and when I had my interview to be hired, one of the things they said to me is that a lot of our students are first-generation Americans, first-generation college students, I'm a first-generation college student, um, and how, how are you going to be able to relate to these people? And I said, well, that's who I am. I, you know, but they were like shocked. The interview community was shocked because it's become a racial issue. And since I look white, um, people thought, well, how can you be the child of immigrants and that your parents don't have a high school education? And so I definitely totally relate to my students and relate to uh, uh, refugees because that, that is my background, but everybody is like shocked about it. And I did um, a public art project in Arlington. It's not in this exhibition, but it is in the uh, catalog book that goes with the show that was um, on an Arlington transit bus. And it had um, the stories of six different Arlington residents and their immigration stories. And it starts in the 1600s and goes up to the present day of present immigrants to make the point that except for Native Americans, we are all immigrants. And most of the immigrants who came here were not educated. And mostly, unless they came from England, did not speak English. So I, t I totally relate to this. And with the Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition, um, it feels very close to me because their cemetery is, uh, was desecrated in the 1960s and is currently being desecrated again. And it's similar to what happened to my mother's cemetery in Poland when she went back to visit. The Jewish cemetery there was completely um, destroyed and the tombstones were used to line swimming pools. Um, you know, which is horrific. Um, and it's, it's the same thing. And it's, it's, so to me, it is all, all the same. All the same, but with lots of differences. <laughs> right, 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 right. Do you have questions for each other? I want to give each of you a chance to respond. Or we could, yeah, come, yes, please. Um, I'm very curious about, like, uh, the, the notions of image and it's, you know, like 1400, I think 1400 U Street was one of the image, 1200s, I just saw earlier, yes, First Street. And there it seems like the, the, the notions of collage is sort of like, in a sense, metamorphosis. And how, how, how do you feel about like when you begin constructing these collage? Well, I'm really interested in change and, and something has always come before where we live. And this is something that Sally and I tend to disagree with, but I feel like we feel the ghosts of the past. When you go into a, a neighborhood, you kind of feel it, even if you don't know the history. To, and I want to make the history overt and to people to learn what the history is and it's often surprising um, and it tells you a lot about our culture and what we value in our culture um, so there's a whole lot of research that goes into all of these um, collages but it's it's to talk about how things are constantly in flux the demographics of the neighborhood changes the uses of the neighborhood changes and it's, that's that's what i'm really interested in and i feel a lot of times it's an inconvenient history that people learn. It's not stuff that is necessarily flattering, um, but it's important to know because it affects us today. Because I, I'm, I'm sort of curious because, you know, like, there's two things I think about when I think about sort of landscapes and collage. And one of the things is, like, people often come up to me uh, because I grew up here in the Midwest and everybody asks, so what's Vietnam's like? And so it's almost like an assumptions that I knew what Vietnam is, but Vietnam is constantly changing. 
the Vietnam that I was raised in, like the 1980s, in the farm, the side, in the farms where farmers were being starved to, and death, be, due to uh, private collectivizations where the government tell you you to only grow certain things, and at the end of the month, based on how much you grow it, then you get the amount of food. And so my family were being starved off, based because of that, and that Vietnam was different than the Vietnam of 1990s, which is called the Doi Mui, where they changed, dra rapidly urbanized Vietnam. And then with the introductions of Korea, because of Korea influence, um, the K-pop, uh, the, the Koreans' industrializations at, after 2000s sort of forced Vietnam to change again. And so for me, it's so interesting when people ask me because the landscape of Vietnam constantly changing and here we have your U Street, you begin to build it and collage it to from previous and then you go move. But yet we get a sense of changing but we don't understand the detriment that happened because, you know, I remember moving to DC in 2008, U Street, 2008, is so much different. And then even a friend who was raised here and say, man, Khan, back in 99, U Street, you just, you just don't want to walk around here. And so, you know, like that's different. But the, you know, the ways your art is, but the, uh, the underlying things that, that we don't talk about, be, uh, you know, like we don't excavate. It's almost like we're, we, we don't have a chance to excavate. Yeah, no, that it's, it's, there's, um, I heard somebody say that if you live in one house for, you know, for decades, you lived in many different neighborhoods. And, and that's, that's what happens. Things, things change. And U Street, you know, was the Black Broadway at one point, and then it was, the, um, like you said, your friend said, it was, there was almost, there were hardly any businesses there. And now it's becoming very gentrified and it becomes more and more every, every year. But it, even before then there was something, before it was the Black Broadway, it, it existed. And some of, the, some of the buildings are still the same buildings, but their uses really change. Yeah. Well, so I'm very curious, can you hear me? Um, so, yeah, I mean, your show is called About Time, and, and, and you, you're really subverting the photograph in a lot of ways because you're really talking about um, change and time instead of a moment. So I'm curious to, to think, um, you know, I know that you, um, some of the images, you know, almost seem like um, they're moving images, and so have you been, have you been curious to, to experiment with film? And like, how, do you, how do you feel about um, film versus um, the kind of uh, collage, time-based photography that you do? So I'm one of the very few people that started off in video. The first thing I did as an undergraduate was documentary videos. And I see a few of them over there. Yeah, there's one there about uh, Donna Allen, Dr. Donna Allen, um, who was a very uh, impressive woman who did media report for women. And the very first thing I did was sexism and Saturday morning children's cartoons, where I didn't do any of the footage. I, I recorded off of television. And this was in the 70s when it was very difficult to record off of television. I had an amazing professor who would come in on Saturday mornings, who was not even, I wasn't even taking a class with him, who would let me in to record off of television on Saturday morning. Can you imagine a college professor doing that? Um, <laughs> But, uh, but I started off with moving images. And th there's, there's two reasons why I really switched to still photography, although I've still done some videos, because there are a couple of um, recent videos in there from the family tapes. Well, they're not recent anymore, but that I've done. Um, the other videos are more documentary that are in there. Um, one thing is, as you were talking about, is video is a collaborative process. You work with a lot of different people, and I really wanted to have control over everything. And I felt like I wasn't assertive enough to really get things my way with video, because it really is, it has to be collaborative, um, was one reason. But the other is, I'm really attached 
to the still image because you can examine it in a way that's different than a moving image. In a moving image, it's very ephemeral and it just, it, you can't just concentrate on it. But as you can see that I use sequential imagery or, uh, or grid pattern or uh, different layers to them, the still image by itself isn't, isn't enough for me. But, but I did start off with the moving image. I'm going to take, I love this conversation, but I want to open it up and entertain questions from all of you. Uh, so please, if you have questions for any of the panelists, raise your hand. I can project. My question is, is to Khan that your images are showing uh, a change from a photo to uh, an, an artwork, but in your artwork, every time behind it, you end up having a honeycomb grid. Is this what the honeycomb is like? A very rigid structure that's sitting sitting behind there. They're like this is something that's not ch not changing, uh, and it's like is that the world is based on the honeycomb? What what is the honeycomb to you that you are putting that? as a background, as the structure that your images are sitting upon? Uh, uh, I love that <laughs> idea of the honeycomb because it's sort of like the perfect, sh the only perfect shape in nature is right, created by bees. Uh, unfortunately, a lot was brought to my attention, but uh, early on, this was the reflections of myself living here in Washington, D.C. Because in the metro area, there's a lot of hexagon shapes on the floor. And the way I let my mind float sometime to wait for the metro to come is just to think, oh, okay, if I, put, if I color this hexagon, leave that hexagon, I can create this shape. And my mind goes off in those kind of way. But over time, these hexagons act like my next coming project, where they act like fence, barrier, um, barriers either keeping things out. And so um, this <coughs> upcoming project, where I begin cutting these out of paper and hanging them together. But yes, these shapes were originally, uh, when I first worked with them, they, I, I just take one single hexagon and keep drawing and transforming. As a printmaker, I like repeated images. I use these, and a lot of times, I love these shapes because it um, a lot of time I try to think of how do I talk about who I am as an artist, and so these represent like myself here in sort of DC. And a lot of these shapes begin playing with the idea of it's interchangeable. It can turn into different shapes. And, I'm, you know, like at first, I just use it as to talk about my DC status. But like you were saying, the shapes become sort of uniform that allow me to create so many different shapes. If you can go back to the uh, previous painting. Uh, there are hexagon shapes in here that allow me to turn it into uh, diamond shapes as well. If you can turn back one more in the other painting. And then these are made out of hexagon shapes. And so for me, I love the idea of how can I just take one shape and change it into many multiple shapes where I see like a lot of immigrant identity, like my father, he was, you know, like he was a maintenance guy. He was, he, we own a franchise to clean offices. He was a delivering for fast Chinese food. And he's multifaceted. And I like, and that was, this is the one constant that was in all my painting is that you see the hexagon, but the a hexagon has been altered from one painting to the next in different pattern but still retain its hexagon. But originally I use it because I want to talk to about myself as a DC, living in DC, as an artist based here in DC. 
But then, as a printmaker, I'm challenging myself. It's like, what other patterns or things I can make just by altering? So with every single painting you see, it's the same hexagon, but just being altered into different shapes uh, using it. I guess I might add to the hexagon as opposed to the more flatly patterned floor at the base, there's a kind of push-pull with it pushing out and then receiving. And it seems to me that you've also described in terms of your family history, kind of push-pull between leaving and looking back, et cetera. And I think uh, it, it may be an important metaphor to think about. Yeah, in terms of push pull, yes, and also like the, the the figure too. A lot of it is you're losing a lot of details because, um, well, what it it is like these patterns pull you in and out and allowing you to not focus on the figures so much because at at certain time I'm thinking about um, how some of these are memories but they're not concrete memories. I remember my experience in refugee camps, but I cannot remember at a moment and point. Only certain things allow me to uh, pull me into that moment, like um, Afghanistan. I remember when we announced that we're pulling our troops from Afghanistan and seeing Af 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 Afghanis sort of giving their children in the, uh, in the tarmac and giving to U.S. soldiers, both my wife and myself sort of wept because we were thinking about our children and remembering uh, us always, our childhood, living near fences because we were near fences and these, and simple shapes like a hexagon bring that in and out of my memory, but not, I cannot recall that exact moment, but only I can call certain point of view and certain things that in current world events pull me back into that moment. Other questions? Yes, please. Atina. No? Yes, yes, yes. Uh. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to sort of ask further about uh, this question of you know, being read as an immigrant or not. Gail, I was so I was I was so intrigued by this kind of you know narrative of that you felt that you weren't being you know perceived or read as someone who was a child of immigrants or, or coming from an immigrant background because you were not of color, right? It was a colorized perception because it seems to me that you know, so much of this, you know, the mythology of the United States is precisely based on, you know, European immigration, right? It's, you know, it's the Statue of Liberty. It's, you know, it's give, give me your teeny masses, your right. degrees free. And, you know, and it extended, you know, well, certainly through the, you know, through the 30s and 40s, you know, sort post, of post-World War II immigration, and then, I mean, even if we take sort of another iconic uh, sort of uh, expression of what does it mean to be an immigrant artist, if we think about sort of the World Trade Center, the war, you know, memorial, and the way in which there was so much emphasis on Daniel Lubiskind arriving as this child refugee, right, uh, from Poland, uh, the child of Holocaust survivors, but leaving only in the 50s, and then he sees this, you know, he remembered that moment of being on the boat. And so, I'm just, I'm, I'm sort of curious how all of you uh, think about, you know, this, it, it, this, this, this sort of, you know, long durée history of who, who gets to count as an immigrant, it, and and whether you also share that sense of that it's shifted, and 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 whether there's a difference maybe between immigrants and refugees, or whether. Uh, something really did change with the 1960s immigration law. I, I'm just kind of interested in your take on that, those shifts, or whether it's really, or whether that shift is actually happening as you mentioned. Who, 
I, I think the shift really happened with the immigration laws. And certainly I am a beneficiary of white privilege and that I'm not looked upon as an other, certainly not immediately. Um, so I, I, so I, it is a very, it is very different kind of experience. It's really interesting to hear me hear you talk about uh, being a refugee, because my, my father was a refugee. I mean, he wasn't in a refugee camp, but he just barely managed to get out. But he never considered himself a refugee. He always talked about being an immigrant and about um, being so happy to be in the United States, and it was like the best thing that could have happened to him. Um, and he, he refused to participate in the reparations that Germany did, partially because he thought they were so paltry, even though he qualified. Um, so it's, it's very interesting how people identify, how they choose to identify. A um, couple of the pictures that I almost sent here were of uh, congregants in different uh, places of worship. Uh, there was one of people dressed in, I don't know if it was Russian clothes or Ukrainian clothes at a bazaar. And, it, and also Monica's thing about saris, I think clothing was probably one of the number one identifiers when I first came here and I used to wear saris everywhere uh, that singled me out as a foreigner. Um, and I think that in the Russian, in the, in the story about the bazaar, I thought this lady is dressed up in a Russian costume and they're all having fun and they're musicians dressed in Russian, Ukrainian costumes and they're all, you know, seem to be enjoying themselves. So it's kind of like a layering of identity. I mean, it's layering of time, layering of identities where you get to play the role of being a Russian American or an Indian American by wearing those clothes in specific situations, in specific places, like a place of worship. Um, but then for the for what I'm calling the white mainstream, when you leave and when you're dressed in pants or skirts or whatever, you look like everybody else. Nobody singles you out as a foreigner or a different uh, or an other. Whereas the pictures I had from a Korean church, for example, those and, and, and people who are black or visibly different, like, you know, visibly different minorities, they never get to shake that other identity. It's something that is stuck to them. So uh, I just wanted to point that out, you know, that, that uh, I have lived in this country for almost 50 years, but I still cannot look at a person and say they are Jewish or Christian. <laughs> you know, unless I maybe hear them speak or I hear an accent or I hear a Yiddish word or something, I, I really don't know. Uh, so, you know, there is that. Well, I think yeah, these are very interesting questions, like what, what, how we get labeled as immigrant first. I think nowadays, I think people think of immigrants as, as not if your parents immigrated, but you are the person, right? I mean, that's sort of the new definition of, I think it's changed, and so people are looking at, even I, like, you know, I was definitely an immigrant, but I didn't think, and when you become, when you think of yourself as an immigrant and when you don't, I mean, I think as, as, um, as uh, Amita mentioned, sometimes it's the way you dress. I mean, it's true. Like my mother always wore a sari uh, for decades, and it was uh, you know women carry our heritage and our uh, through our clothing or our stories or our cooking, and that's that responsibility. And so that's part of the reason that I started um, you know using the sari in my work is sort of linking to my heritage um, where I came from. But uh, my mother um, switched from wearing the sari to um, one day after she used to work at Catholic charities and. She was um, working at a uh, at the for the Center for the Aging for um, Catholic Charities, and she was went to a nursing home, and she overheard someone saying, one of the nursing home residents saying, "Oh, do you know that nice Indian lady who wears a curtain?" 
<laughs> and my mother came home and told my and told us I'm never wearing a sari to work again because I go to all this trouble and people think it's a curtain. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so and, and then you know who's identified as a foreigner and who's identified as an immigrant. These are also very interesting questions, like, you know, whether, um, and it's, for me, I mean, I, now that I've lived here for many, many years, I have, a, a, most people think I have an American accent. Sometimes people tell me I, I have a British accent, I don't know, I was born in Britain, but um, the, you're the way you speak also, obviously, like, you know, uh, uh, people think of you foreigner, immigrant, there are many different categories, right, um, of, um, of, that people put you in, and like, American, like, what's American, you know? Um, if you're, um, uh, it, it's interesting. A lot of people outside America think of America as, as either being only white or only black, right? Everyone else is not really American. Like, there's a lot of different questions about what it means to be American. What does it mean to be American? What does it mean to be? So these are very um, interesting questions, and I think the definition of the immigrant has shifted in the. Um, in the last few decades. I, I just wanted to point out that uh, a statistic I read that every seventh person in the United States was born in a foreign country. And we have the largest number of immigrants in the world. And Montgomery County in particular, oh, what was it, 130 some uh, different languages are spoken. and. Uh, I think of America as being like the Noah's Ark of religious architecture because since we have representatives of just about every country on earth here who are immigrants, uh, and I'm counting the, the people who really consider themselves to be settlers or colonials rather than immigrants. Sometimes there's a dispute about my putting people who came here in the 1600s on the same level with us Indians and Bangladeshis in the late 20th century. But um, I believe that there's a very strong common denominator. Just about every person in this country, barring the Native Americans, are either immigrants themselves or are descendants of immigrants, at least in the past 500 years. And it's just a question of, I think that this is, this rate of change is happening very, very fast. And I think that's the backlash that we're looking at politically across Europe and other parts of the world, and in the United States itself with the white supremacist movement, um, is sort of predictable, somewhat a little predictable, because I think that these things are happening very quickly and people need help in understanding where these people have come from, who they are. And with that in mind, I started an, an LLC called Cultural Literacy Associates, because I feel, uh, in my great wisdom, <laughs> that uh, I believe that as the world has come together so fast, and we have neighborhoods where we have so many different countries represented, that we need to do something about sharing information about ourselves and about each other and learning a little bit more about the rest of the world so that it won't feel quite so different and so foreign. Going back to the question of wearing saris, uh, people would keep telling me, oh, come comfortably dressed. And it took me a long time to understand that comfortably dressed meant don't wear a sari. <laughs> Because it probably made other people uncomfortable. This is in the 70s, you know. And then I noticed that whenever I walked into a party wearing a sari, because those were the only dress clothes I had. I mean, I really didn't know how to wear dresses. I, I mean, jeans and slacks, every day fine. But going out, I still tend to wear Indian clothes. And I'd get there and people would ask me questions like, Oh, so when did you come here? And then the other question was, when are you leaving? You know, I guess I got weaned out of my habit of wearing saris, and now I'm just basically too broad and too heavy, and it's too much trouble. And so, Monica, I have boxes of saris, brocades under my bed 
in the drawers. Some of them are hanging on the walls because I don't know what to do with them. Someone, some of them have been ripped up. My friend chiffon, my beautiful yellow French chiffon, has been ripped up into accessories for my curtains. So tell your mother that they, that they wound up as curtains in the end. And I really, and really don't know what to do with them. And I still go to the Indian stores here, the sari stores, and I get seduced into buying more saris, <laughs> which again I don't know what to do with. So here's the problem for all of you. I can give you all a sari. Um, can I talk uh, on that question too? I think it's interesting, you know, like this is one of the things I try to undertake because COVID has exposed a lot of things in our society and one of it is like uh, words and meanings and certain things. Refugees, immigrant, they're different status, right? Immigrant, you're legal, you have means to come. Refugees, you're, you're being helped, you're being aided. Uh, legal, illegal. And this is the conversations that I have with my family members, my parents. You know, it's like, in the outside, we're, we're American, we're legal immigrant. I tell them, no, we're refugees. You were political refugees. You come here. Because with them, there's a trauma of saying that I've been aided. I've been given something to be here. So therefore, I'm lesser in a societal worth, you know? And so this exposed, being exposed during COVID time, uh, tons of um, people try to be on the shore of Europe, tons of people at our border, separations of parents and child, tons of people coming up, and our former president is calling them, these are trash these are people who don't have anything and we're not if you come to our border we're going to separate from you from your child and it's a problem is it becomes a problematic in words and lingos that sort of resonates with those who bears the mark of refugees who lived in refugees who are immigrant and so these signify these because you know, like sir, with with Gail's work and uh, her photography and her text, that's why it's so important. These words and image, because these now become sort of a forefront in our society and how we sort of deal with these issues. And so, oftentimes, how do we talk about these kind of words? How do our children? able to live with these kind of words, whether they're refugees or, or immigrant, because it's hard. It's hard to be, a, to be the call, oh, I'm a refugee, or for, of a, if you're a child and being able to say, other child's calling you a refugee, and so they don't want to stand out. And so oftentimes, these are the contradictory things that I see that sort of I have to meditate with my own art and allowing that conversations to happen through exhibitions that, so that we can have a a more broader uh, you know conversation so that it allow us to expand beyond what black and white definitions of immigrant or refugee is and i think you make a very important point and i think so even using the word immigrant i mean i I did an exhibition in, in Greece in 2018. It was called Footprint, and I made a house, like a shelter out of saris, and it was, a, it was actually dealing with the um, migrant and refugee crisis. And the, the words that they were using there was refugee was very narrow. It was for people that were actually going to be granted political asylum, and everyone else was called a migrant, right? And so that was the terminology of the, of the um, Athens um, and Greek government. And, you know, and it's, it's um, so, so their refugee was actually a positive thing because they were actually going to be going through the process and everyone else was basically, 
you know, illegal migrant. And for me, working on climate change, of course, there are a lot of people now that are that are migrating and are called climate refugees. But of course, climate change does not come within the UN definition of refugee. So again, as Khan, as Khan says, I mean, these words and limitations on who are considered legal and who is acceptable, right, um, are, are, are things that we really need to be um, challenging through our artwork and in our general discussions as a community. And it's really these labels that we put in. And we have a lot of people coming to this country who are, who are coming for economic reasons or because of um, gender-based violence or gang violence or other things that do not count as, you know, um, as for asylum and they don't fall into our immigration categories, yet we rely on all these people for labor in this country. I mean, this country is built on the labor of a lot of people who are not under any official immigration category, you know? I mean, all the housekeepers and all the all the gardeners and all the construction workers in and the D.C. The, and uh, everywhere else, most of them. And all the enslaved people. And all the enslaved people who don't officially count as immigrants, forced immigrants. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, these are like, this is, the, I mean, not that, so it's a complex issue, and the, and the labeling of people, um, even the word immigrant itself is, is very complicated, right? Um, Thank you. We have a question from the other end of the gallery, please. Yes. Um, I'd like to add a couple other layers to what you're talking about. Great. First, first of all, um, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, it can be dangerous to wear sari now, or to stand out, or to wear a yarmulke, for example. Um, and you know, in this polyglot of Montgomery County, uh, you know, there are um, uh, neo-Nazis leaving brochures about Jews all over the place. So that's that's number one. Uh, the second thing is is that. Uh, a consideration that some of us here might be thinking that someday we might have to be refugees. Uh, a couple months ago, three or four months ago, uh, Dana Milbank in the Washington Post uh, uh, talked about uh, a high holiday service that he attended in which his rabbi stopped the service to talk about the fact that Jews might have to start thinking, where will we go if this keeps happening? And I actually wrote a, a letter to the editor. Uh, my name is very uh, anglicized. Uh, I can pass. Uh, but I said to myself, I consider myself off-white uh, because my whiteness is conditional. And so uh, that, you know, it's conditional to just like in Germany, you know, you could have been a good German. Uh, and yet, if you were Jewish, your, your neighbors did not consider you German. So that is another layer. So those are both two different layers uh, to the whole issue of refugees. I guess I'm going to close with that and thank you for that comment. And also point out, because I want to leave time for people to study the exhibition either for the first time if they just showed up before the conversation or again, that Gail's work includes a floor piece called Welcome. And if you stand and read it carefully, you will see that actually uh, the final line is welcome until we're not. Um, and I, I really liked Amita's speaking of recalling, uh, feeling as if people were uh, which were so sorry, uh, saying, oh, how long have you been here? And when are you leaving? <laughs> and um, how easy it is for uh, those who feel like we have a stake here um, to act as if all others are in some ways <clears throat> conditional and temporarily here and easily abandoned or exiled, banished, etc. So I love the, f I'm so glad Gail encouraged me. We have to find a place for her welcome piece, and that we put it, we found a place on the floor, this was in part my suggestion, because uh, it plays with the whole idea of a floor mat that erupts the ground, just as I find that Gail's work so much erupts the smooth space of the normal photographic image. I, I want to thank all of you, and I want to thank Gail, and I want to thank all of you for coming today, and I hope you tell other people about the exhibition. Thank you.